Hello and welcome, welcome back everybody. Uh, my name is David Gosley and today I'm speaking, I have the pleasure of speaking with the one and only Barbara Held. Professor Barbara Held is Barry Wish Professor Emerita of Psychology and Social Studies at Bowdoin College. She's both a clinical psychologist and a theoretical and philosophical psychologist. She was the recipient of a, a Joseph Gitzler Award from the American Psychological Foundation uh, in 2012. That's for outstanding contribution to the philosophical foundations of psychological knowledge. More recently, uh, she received the Arthur Stotts Award from APA Division I. We might touch on that uh, in, in our conversation. Her books include Back to Reality, a Critique of Postmodern Theory in Psychotherapy uh, and uh, Psychology's Interpretive Turn. Those two are single authored books. And another book I'd like to mention is one co-edited with Lisa Osbeck, uh, which is titled Rational Intuition, Philosophical Roots and Scientific Investigations. Professor Held, uh, thank you very much for, uh, to ex for accepting my invitation. And, uh, thank you for the invitation. My pleasure. My pleasure. I was looking forward to this uh, a lot. So let's Maybe. begin uh, with a general question about your work, especially for people who are not as familiar. Uh, how would you situate your work within the broader landscape of psychology? And maybe you could also, to help situate your perspective, point to some uh, agreements and disagreements with some points of reference. Well, the latter will would take hours and you have um, given me questions um, yeah. very graciously that go to specific points of agreement and disagreement. So I'll just say for now that I started out as a clinical psychologist. And when we get to the question about my life history, um, I quickly, when I got to Bowdoin College, for uh, owing to an event, I'll explain, um, became um, interested in, in philosophy of psychology. And that kind of turned me into um, a theoretical and philosophical psychologist. I, mean, I need to qualify here that all research psychologists work with theory. Philosophical psychologists, who also call them themselves theoretical psychologists, work with meta theory, which is really philosophy. You know, the grounding, the the assumptions you start with before you investigate any question. So it's really meta theoretical psychology. So I kept teaching my clinical courses, but with injecting lots of the philosophical questions. Um, in terms of my uh, just a general statement about agreement and disagreement, I didn't know there was a division of theoretical and philosophical psychology of the American Psychological Association. Some of them who I ended up critiquing thought I because of my book Back to Reality, a critique of postmodern theory and psychotherapy thought that didn't like social constructionism. So they tried to bring me into their fold because they thought I could help them fight social constructionism. But they were postmodern too in their own way. I called them middle ground theorists. And I ended up writing a second book critiquing them. Mm -hmm. So caveat emptor, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, so my, um, I, uh, I really don't have any general big beefs with psychology. I won't say all theoretical psychologists or even most, but the ones who are most vocal are the ones I have disagreements with. And we'll get into the specifics of those mm. as you wrote the questions. Right, right. Um, so how was that process of coming to that perspective? Well, you mentioned something, not having a big beef. And to me, correct me if I'm wrong, I translate that to not being part of a camp. And this is something I'm learning from you, that is different. Uh, being part of a camp is different from being critical and thinking critically. Uh, it's one thing to think critically, engage critically with psychology, and it's one thing to be part of a camp or a group of people who have a kind of stance. So, um, An agenda. If, yeah, an, an agenda. agenda. Right, right. So um, the agenda of the, the most visible theorists, really meta-theorists, but you know, I, you know, I won't keep saying that, 
is to reform what they call mainstream psychology. Um, that, you know, it's scientistic, it's reductionistic, mm -hmm. and that, you know, it's incorrigible, it's, you know, uh, willful ignorance, it's naive, um, you can't use numbers. And th that's a movement, that's a mission. And they will call it, you know, a, 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 mo a movement that subsumes many spe specific kinds. And um, I'm against that. Uh, and they tar what they call mainstream psychology with the broad brush of scientism, and it either has to be amended, you know, a lot or burn it to the ground and start over and everything has to be personhood. And you can't study individual concepts like intuition, like uh, Lisa Osbeck and I did, because that's not studying personhood in in historical and cultural context. So how, you know, shame on you. And I think it's, um, it's uh, they want to expand and I think it constricts. Mm -hmm. uh, I think yeah. if that's what you want to do, do it and stop bashing the so-called mainstream, which Lisa and I, by the way, don't think there's a mainstream. There are individual research programs. If you want to criticize a specific research program and say how you would do it better, fine. But this broad tarring, uh, you know, with the brush of scientism and reductionism and incorrigibility is, um, it's ad hominem and it's wrong. Yeah, not productive. I think, I think it, I, it's unproductive and I think it's immoral in some of its instantiations, not mm -hmm. all. Like name calling, mm -hmm. you know, right, is right. Yeah, ad hominem attacks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so uh, related to that, now I'm really curious how you, how it came to your position, to your perspective, to your style. How did you find your style of scholarship, kind of the well, personal journey? Yeah, my style of scholarship and my personhood are one and the same. According to my parents, by age two, I was questioning all received wisdoms. Um, uh, I don't remember doing this, but at the age of three and a half, my grandmother took me to see Balanchine's, the first year production of The Nutcracker, Balanchine's Nutcracker at the New York City Ballet. Of course, I'm Barbara from the Bronx. And I remember leaving my purse at the restaurant and being hysterical about that. But I don't remember sitting in the front row center seats that my grandmother got for free because she made contributions to a charity. No one had any money. And according to my grandmother, when the curtain opened, I stood up on my seat at the age of like, oh, like two months shy of four and screamed at the top of my lung, lungs, mom, mom, I called my grandmother, mom, mom, mommy's mommy there's a problem. The boys aren't wearing any pants. Their tuchus is showing, <laughs> meaning their backside, <laughs> proving Freud wrong. It wasn't penis envy. <laughs> and so began my career of, um, as my husband says, swimming upstream and talking about when there was a problem. There were many other examples of this in preschool and, you know, and throughout my life. So, it was not surprising that I would end up being kind of a gadfly because I started out as, you know, as just by nature. And my parents encouraged it. They were constantly getting called in by teachers for me pointing out truths like when I discovered that Santa wasn't real. Mm -hmm. And I felt I had to let the whole preschool class know because um, the, the, the guy in the Santa costume wanted us to sit on his on his lap and take candy and I told him that I'm not doing this because we you know this is the Bronx we don't talk to strange men who try to give little kids candy and all the other kids agreed with me once they realized you get presents from your parents parents called in really um, according to my parents um, saying I, I ruined their child's Christmas I didn't ruin their child's Christmas I ruined their Christmas the kids were fine once they knew they got presents my parents always backed me up because I was a good kid. I wasn't breaking rules. I was just, you know, <laughs> telling the truth as I understood it and bucking received wisdoms that were not allowed. 
So um, I actually started out as a studio art major because by age eight, I was painting in oil paintings. And, and some of my parents' friends wanted to buy them and my parents gave them oil paintings. I uh, have one left and um, I was okay with not taking money for it. And I got to, and I was taking special classes after school. And I got to college and took studio art and um, it seemed that I would starve in a garret. I looked around and really like the talent didn't grow with me in age. So I still took lots of humanities courses. I took like 10 art history courses. I took five English lit courses. I was very interested in the humanities, but like, how do you make a living with the humanities? I took psych, clinical psych seemed like a real profession. My father was a first generation American who went to night high school and night college forever because he had to work from the time he was 14. Um, started a CPA firm, which is still going in New York today with the name held. And so a profession I understood. And so um, I did that, got a PhD in clinical psych. And my second year at Bowdoin, I had, I had just come back from a conference on what was, this was like 1981-ish, <laughs> um, a conference on postmodernism in psychotherapy, you know, mm -hmm. narrative therapy. There is no truth, there's just viewpoints, his truth, her truth, whatever. And that's fine if we're not talking about the same thing, but if we're talking about the same thing, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's not like one person's feeling the trunk and one person's feeling the leg. If we're talking about what is an elephant in Toto, different truths are, become problematic, relativism, epistemic relativism. So I bumped into my neighbor, Ed Poles in his sixties, who was a, um, an, a very respected philosopher of science. And um, he worked mostly in metaphysics and at the, the conjunction of metaphysics and um, epistemology. And I'd started blabbering, what is this no truth stuff, whatever. And he very graciously gave me a two year private weekly tutorial in philosophy of science. We started with Descartes, you know, Kant, um, Hume. Um, he, was, he was a real Aristotelian in some ways, but he had his own philosophy um, of rationality. So I got hooked. And so I started from, the, we wrote four articles together challenging this postmodern stuff, this philosophy being written by non-philosophers which should sound, you know, a lot like theoretical psychologists <laughs> um, critiquing them. This is in the 1980s. And um, I started putting more philosophical nuance into my classes, but I taught the real so-called mainstream stuff because, uh, as you said, I'm not, I want my, I wanted my students to know what psychology, how it was being practiced knowing that it would, the facts would change and how to think critically, not from the viewpoint of psychology is only the study of personhood or this or that, but just how to think. And the, the music to my ears today is my students who are now in their 50s and 60s write to me and say, you taught me how to think. And that to me is the, the job. <laughs> not to push an agenda mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you don't like the mainstream and they don't listen to what you say. So boo hoo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how I got into this. Yeah. And a position like epistemic relativism is not thinking. That's a, it's a huge well, assumption that, that. Well, it can't, I mean, it come, come it, I would not go that far. There are philosophers who promote epistemic relativism on philosophical grounds, but there's so many kinds of rel relative to what, what kind of relativisms that are very well thought out. And some of, and I've read some of them and I've 
you know, some, and they make me think, which is what the point is mm -hmm. anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't dismiss them just out of hand, but what's going on in, in the theoretical psychology world is, um, you know, it's just, you know, well, we can't have, have absolute truth as if there is an absolute truth will as william james said ever not quite the title of lisa's new book there's always more to be said there is no so like these charges are straw men and women um there's absolute truth and apodictic and there's no universal uh versality because um we're all cultural all the way down and you can't there's nothing in in us that's universal mentally. And I'm like, that strikes me as nuts. How do we talk to each other? Right, right. It's, <laughs> how how yeah. am I talking to you now? Yeah, how could yeah. we have this, if there's not some capacity and some basic ways of reasoning that are universal? So mm -hmm. anyway, yeah. that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Great. <laughs> So I also related to that, I wanted to ask you about a paper you wrote uh, titled Why There is Universality in Rationality. Yeah, I have to look at my notes. And uh, this is relevant to what you touched on already because many critics argue for cultural relativism. And, and I agree, it can be defended rigorously, but if it is used, if that stance is used as a starting point and the, and the finish point, like there's no room, it, it is uh, offered as a way to eliminate certain ways of thinking. Well, because or, the big bad mainstream allegedly proposes universal apodictic truths, which I've never seen a psychological researcher do. Mm -hmm. In fact, they usually at the end of their study say, here are some things that need further thinking, investigation. You know, this might not apply else, uh, in other places. So mm -hmm. it's a straw man. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, that article, that was my presidential address for the Division of Theoretical and Philosophical Psychology, which I bid my farewell to. Of course, there are many kinds of rationality, many ways of reasoning, but that's true within cultures as well as between. Mm -hmm. That's right. Right? I mean, uh, inductive, deductive, dialectical, metaphorical, um, um convergent, divergent. I mean, there's so many different kinds of reasoning that uh, even between people raised in the same culture in the same family, or, you know, they can't agree on, on a product of reasoning because they're working through it differently or they, you know, whatever. But again, if there was no universal rational capacity that entailed some basic ideas like conjunction and negation, uh, you know, the capacity to join two ideas together to come up with a plan, or, you know, to say, no, this instead of this, so this negates that, then we can't talk. And this is the basis of a book that was very influential in my thinking, the philosopher Simon Evnine at University of Miami in Florida, and I had the good fortune of doing two separate two semester um, sabbaticals there as a visiting scholar. He wrote a book, Epistemic Dimensions of Personhood. I'm reading from my notes here. I put on my glasses um, in which um, there are four epistemic dimensions of any kind of personhood. We don't just talk about personhood. He actually works it through epistemically and they are finitude. All persons have finitude, we exist in space and time, we all have beliefs, second ordinality, beliefs about our beliefs, and agency. And from those four conditions, he pulls out logically or analytically um, different capacities um, that are necessary for um, being in the world, uh, conjunction, conditionality, disjunction, negation, and quantification, that he put, he draws these out from the four uh, ep basic epistemic dimensions and said, you're going to have personhood in any sense that anyone talks about it. You have to, these, and he says these are universal. In that paper, I took on 
those who argue for uh, naturalized epistemology. In other words, how are people reasoning in different parts of the world versus um, um, the normative view that many scholars have put forth of rationality? Sure, again, different people and within and between different cult cultures reason differently and come up with different beliefs and products. And of course, they also have different contents that they're working on. Um, in that paper, Richard Nisbet, a famous cognitive psychologist who wrote the influential book, The Geography of Thought, argued that Asians and Westerners differ on the um, law of contradiction, the logical law of, of, of non-contradiction, which he put forth is P and not P can't both be true, right? And that Westerners adhere to that and Asians want a middle way such that P and not P uh, can both be true. And I show in my paper how if you look at the items on the test he get, gave, he didn't even test it. The opposed, the so-called opposed positions that they had arrayed as plausible or not were not contradictions. Hmm. So they did, you know, they weren't even contra they were different, but they weren't contradictions. So he didn't even test it. Right. And so too with Schwader's divergent rationalities. The um uh, philosopher um, Har Harvey Siegel, who was also at Miami at the time, has written about, you know, presupposing that what which you're knocking down. So Richard Schwader talks about divergent rationalities and, you know, but how can you know them or evaluate them? From what rationality or what rational stance do you evaluate <laughs> the divide, divergent rationalities that that mean there is no universality in rationality it's self defeating mm -hmm. so um these are this is you know i go into this in that that, that paper if anyone is interested you know in, in the journal of theoretical and philosophical psychology i'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds here mm -hmm. sure uh, it's kind is, of yeah. yeah yeah so that's that's basically the story yeah to uh one implication of uh, your argument for universality in rationality is that we should keep trying to connect. Because if I if I believe that my style of rationality is different, so fundamentally different from yours, then I'll just give up, and rather than trying to build bridges and try to understand the well, other culture right. or other side. I I couldn't agree more. And that again, theoretical psychologists whom I critique are like, we have to be worried about the other and we have to understand the other. And we have to um, not do epistemic violence against the other. That was another paper that I wrote about. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, if we don't share some universal rational capacity, how do you begin to understand the other? How do you argue on behalf of the other? Mm -hmm. So... You know, this no universals thing that is a starting assumption that's never questioned in any real depth, not like the people I'm, the philosophers I'm talking about, mm -hmm. who really dig in. Mm -hmm. And I dug into what they dug into and then went, you know, took that and went went my own way further. Yeah, yeah. I uh, tried reading uh, Richard Nisbet's book about East versus West, I honestly couldn't get past page five. It was just so difficult. It was, I felt really irritated Is by this it. the book, The Geography of Thought? Yeah, yeah. Oh, I had to take anti-nausea medicine, but I needed to read it because that's what I decided to give as my presidential lecture and which appeared in, you know, which then I developed into this long, much longer article, mm -hmm. you know, what, how do they say, gag me with a spoon. <laughs> so, you know, I don't think it's you, or if it is you, it's you and me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> especially, especially because at the time I was teaching in Asia, and the hardest thing for me to watch was to see students in, you know, from an Asian, like from Chinese students, 
use those theories to say, oh, but I'm, I'm different. This is what you're teaching me is Western uh, psychology. I am Chinese, so I can't relate to it. Can, and you give an is, can, you, um, can you give an example of something they said I can't relate to that? The, the structure of an essay, for example, that uh, considering a, a position and then considering the opposite of it or the critique, uh, the position that critiques that original position. And uh, they would hear, for example, from somebody else that these, as you said, the um, law of non-contradiction doesn't apply as much to this context. And they would use it as an excuse to not delve into op opposing viewpoints. Want to write a paper together about that? Sure. I'm not kidding. That would be very interesting. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because it has, yeah, it has, those are real consequences of these. Yeah, and I think that those consequences need to be known. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of uh, difficult perspectives to engage with, positive psychology. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you have a paper on that uh, as well, 2017. Many uh, papers, many. Yeah, yeah, there are many critiques uh, of positive psychology, but the way you uh, you address it is unique. I found unique. Uh, namely, you talk about that unreflective dichotomy of positive and negative. That's actually the uh, gen general presentations of positive psychology usually start with that. Say, like, oh, psychology tends to focus on the negative. What we bring to the table is we, we focus on the positive. So that's why we are great. Uh, so your, your challenge too. I wanted to ask about that. Okay. So I'm one of the very first cri critics of the positive psychology movement. And I actually criticized the movement before there was a movement mm -hmm. because like my contrarian swim upstream, tell everyone from age two why they're getting it wrong. Um, you might guess that Barbara from the Bronx was not the most optimistic person in the world. I mean, as a friend put, put it, I have thousands of years of Jewish panic bred into me. I'm a Jewish atheist, but that would have qualified me for Auschwitz. It wasn't what you, you believed. It's your lineage. It's in the blood, you know, the right. evil blood. So, um, and my parents were first generation Americans. And fortunately, both sides got out of Eastern Europe, Romania on my mother's side and Austria on my father's many years before World War I. They weren't sticking around for, uh, you know, more bad events. So I don't come from a line of positive, <laughs> if, let's, let's get the hell out of here. They came in like, before, in like before 1910. And as the saying goes, when Hitler came to power in 1933, the uh, pessimistic Jews went to New York and the optimistic Jews went to Auschwitz. And my family went to New York <laughs> before World War I. So that's my um, temperamental style. Um, so uh, I, you know, I was, I wrote, after I wrote Back to Reality, a critique of postmodern theory and psychotherapy, which almost killed me, um, I had to learn so much philosophy. I needed something fun. And so I gave a, a talk at the 1996 APA convention. I was on a panel with Almar and, and um, Arnie Lazarus, who then became a friend because he, he lived in that New York area, um, entitled The Importance of Kvetching in Theory, Research, and Practice. And they were like, I don't know, several hundred people in the room and they were hysterical. The whole, I gave, and I, there I developed my five rules of kvetching, if like how to kvetch constructively, you know, how to kvetch and still have friends, which I'm an expert at because uh, I'm a very kvetchy person. So um, someone, one of Arnie Lazarus's friends said, you know, you should write a book about this. I couldn't publish it. She said, self-publish it. We did. And then, um, and that was 1999. And then in 2000, I put together a panel entitled The Overlooked Virtues of Negativity. <laughs> um, um, uh, Erica Good, um, a well-known science writer from the New York Times attended. She called me up. She interviewed me. The next thing I know, I'm featured 
in the Sunday New York Times, August, I think 15, um, 2000, um, um, and, and an article entitled Seeing Pessimism's Place in a Smiley-Faced World. Um, there's several, you know, it begins with Dr. Barbara Hell does not want to smile, look on the bright side or have a nice day. It goes on for five paragraphs, ending with my self-published book, Stop Smiling, Start Kvetching. She interviewed Seligman too. And then, be, and then that I was in a media blitz for months, hours every day. A psychologist says it's okay not to be optimistic. News wow. all over the world, like, duh. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm being interviewed in all these crazy places. I mean, even Russia picked it up. And the next day it came out on the front page of the what was then the International Herald Tribune. So it was all over the world, on TV, radio, newspapers. Uh, RTE, Ireland's public radio, interviews me. I said, wait a minute, aren't the Irish known for their depressogenic attitude? And the uh, the host of the radio show said, yes, but we've imported your American smiley face, mm -hmm. and now we need your help too to be negative. <laughs> so, you know, that started that whole career. So... Um, uh, a year later, it got picked up by um, St. Martin's Press. Uh, I was on the Today Show a week before 9-11. Everyone's calling in. But in 2000, uh, um, Seligman started the uh, positive psychology movement officially. But I had already been, you know, trashing positivity. I mean, not tr that's not fair. If that's your nature and your attitude and that style works for you, great, as long as you know what reality is. Right. Um, you know, I'm not for, I'm against one size fits all. Therefore, one size fits all. Mm -hmm. So I'm, back to your question, I'm not sure that I'm that unique. I know I was very early on the scene, like second, if not first, on the scene. Um, and yeah, my first thing is, and this is not, I borrowed a lot of this from Julie Norum at Wellesley, a psychologist. She wrote the, she published the same year as I published my, the um, 2001 Stop Smiling, Start Fetching, St. Martin's Press. She published The Positive Power of Negative Thinking based on her years of research about um, the ways in which negativity works. But my a priori paper, is it just struck me from day one that you cannot say a priori independent of a particular person's context, by which I mean both their, uh, their interpersonal social context and their internal psychological temperamental style and context, whether any emotion or mental state is positive or negative, good or bad. And the example I like to give you know, this anger is a bad emotion. Well, if a woman's getting battered and she gets really angry and it helps her leave, isn't that constructive? Isn't that a good emotion? Didn't that help her instead of just making excuses for him? In terms of internal um, uh, states, Julie Norm's research shows that for people high in anxiety, like me, um, if you are asked to think positive, you get more anxious and function less well because you can't, mm -hmm. because it's not your nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she has, I mean, maybe hundreds, maybe at least dozens, I mean, like 40 years of, re this was her, her thesis. She demonstrated that, um, that different coping styles, you know, help different kinds of people function better. And what she called defensive pessimism, which is like seeing everything when you're anxious about something. If you have an anxiety temperament, you're anxious about something, thinking about what can go wrong and planning for what you'll do in those cases, which is looking on the negative side, you perform better in a variety of tasks, all kinds, cognitive tasks, social tasks, you name it. Whereas people who are what she calls strategic optimists, um, 
uh, who are asked to look on, you know, like what can go wrong and whatever, they function worse if they are asked to use a style that goes against their natural temperament, you know. So one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, the, I'm not sure I'm the only one to make the a priori um, distinction, but that seemed to me most fundamental. The, the thing that also struck me Im immediately was that this all of psychology is negative and we have to balance it with positive psychology, with the, looking at the good stuff. It's like, that's flat out wrong. Yes, clinical psychology looks at pathology and you can say that's negative, but the, you know, from a value system. But the rest of psychology isn't positive or negative. Yeah, yeah. That that reasoning, there's something to that reasoning that is a little bit like a trick. It's like saying psychologists who are studying perception, they are paying too much attention to perceptual illusions. They should pay attention to where we see vertical, we have vertical perception. But, but, but that's a I, really good analogy. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a really good analogy. It also, it shows that trick because when we pay attention to illusory perception, we are actually, we are, we are trying to understand the mechanisms of perception, not the illusions themselves. And similarly, we are not understanding negativity for its own sake. We are trying to understand psychological mechanisms and, and states. But I also, I can't, I, again, you can't use the terms positive and negative independent of internal and external context. So what are we talking about? What are they talking about? And then we, of course, we have Barbara Fredrickson's three to one positivity ratio from physics, you know, three positive thoughts to every one negative mm -hmm. is what you need for flourishing. And, and um, a friend of mine, Alan Sokol, a the famous Sokol's hoax. I don't know if you know about yeah, Sokol, yeah. but he's a friend. Um, he took that down on, you know, I mean, he's he's a, a, a mathematical physicist. So, you know. they, funny enough, they have that. I'm sure you've heard they, they have, have that ratio, similar ratio for relationships. It's, I think, five to one that uh, for a good relationship, you need five positives to one negative, something like that, which is. I and there was again, that they are defining positive and negative a priori independent of any particular yeah internal or external and external situation. Mm -hmm. Bull hockey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So uh, you have a chapter in a, a volume that Thomas Thiel edited in, uh, it was, it came out in 2019. It's called re-envisioning theoretical psychology. And uh, your chapter is partly about how theoretical and philosophical psychology can learn from um, other disciplines, such as you know th th advances in theoretical physics, for example, or work in philosophy with uh, philosophy of psychology or philosophical psychology. Um, maybe we can pause a little bit on that uh, on that contribution. How that differs from uh, other ways of re-envisioning theoretical psychology. Actually, you, you critique that from the very beginning of the chapter. You say, yeah, this invitation to re-envision, to re rework psychology has been happening for, for a while. Um, itself is not new. Okay. So All right. So um, first, let me say that Thomas Teo and, his, Teo and his wife are good friends of of me and David, and he's like one of the only only people in this theoretical camp that that like we can actually have conversations he puts me in his books I say so you know I think he's very smart we disagree on a lot of things but I don't think he was saying it was new he was mm -hmm. uh, he was wanting to re-envision it in a new way I don't think he thought the idea of, I mean Thomas is too smart and historically knowledgeable to say that um the, as a, what can we learn from physics? It's sort of, it's an irony. It's an ironic thing we can learn. Theorists bash um, the, the, the so-called physics envy of the mainstream because they use numbers and experimental designs like physicists do, and that's physics envy, and those that's bad, and that makes like the mainstream evil and wrong and bad and, you know, incorrigible and whatever. Here's the irony I find. 
the theorists I write about are constantly kvetching that the mainstream, so-called mainstream, aren't paying attention to them. And they should be because we should have a clearing ground in a, you know, uh, a non-empirical philosophical grounding before you even ask a research question. And I'm like, wait a minute, isn't that wanting to be like physics where we have theoretical physicists doing the mathematics that suggest what is and isn't possible and then the, the experimentalists then try to work that out in the lab. Why do you want to be like the physicists, the, the discipline, and have a theory, a meta-theoretical, in the case of the theoretical physics, uh, you know, mathematical um, description of what's possible and not, that the, re the researchers pay attention to? You hate physics. You talk about physics envy. Now you want to emulate the way physics works? Shame on you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is, um, it's hypocritical. But yeah. So I'm not saying you can learn from physics research. I'm saying, why do you want to structure Psychology, all of psychology, the way physics is structured as a discipline, if you think it's so horrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, this is a big theme I picked up from reading your work uh, so far. A big theme is that when we are critiquing, when we are in you know, theoretical psychology, when we are doing it, usually the major reference points, for example, natural sciences, mainstream psychology, even the humanities, those are distorted. The way they are represented is not what actually happens in like even the humanities, which is like something that is admired and as we're aspiring to it. So we will get to that in a, one of our yeah, next I wanted questions. To, but. Yes, of course. Um, uh, one other thing, though, I wanted to say in that chapter is that philosophers, and I consider the theorists I'm talking about wannabe philosophers, so why didn't you get a PhD in philosophy? You got an undergraduate degree in psychology. If you thought it was so horrible, why did you get a PhD in psychology? Why didn't you get one in philosophy? Good question. And become the real deal. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, I, I didn't get a PhD in philosophy, but I didn't know I I didn't think undergrad that philo that psychology was bad in grad school either. And I still don't. Um, but if you did, why did you keep going? Um, but bona fide philosophers of science use research findings in their science to help them advance their philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, my good friend, David Livingstone Smith, um, had a book on biophilosophy in which there was a chapter by Luc Fauché um, in which they use... Um, biological research on race to show that racial categories aren't real. The assumption that there's some essence, you know, that makes one a member of one race and someone else, that they don't exist. And in fact, there's more ge genetic variation within races than between. So the category race makes no sense you know it's right. it, it, it's it's used to oppress and of course here's another irony the theorists i i critique are like you know um we have to have um you know radical change and attention to different races and other people and all they don't know this stuff and um, and they're you know bashing the use of science in their the meta theoretical work when the actual real philosophers are using biological science, which sometimes uses numbers and sometimes doesn't. Of course, they would say, well, you can have numbers for physical things, but not mental things. But that's then you know. I say, how do we get construct validity and predictive validity if we're measuring nothing? Mm -hmm. um, like the best people doing that, those fields of philosophy of science are using 
the research. They're also using research from psychology, like on implicit racial bias mm -hmm. in their philosophical work. So grow up. Right, right. <laughs> grow up. And really engage. Like actually grow up. You, I immediately had this idea of, uh, you know, Eric Byrne talks about being an adult. Uh, being an adult is somebody who engages with reality. With the, with the the actual states of affairs as opposed to their own judgment so it makes they, sense yeah they they don't see any difference between their judgment and the reality of mainstream the reality of psychology mm -hmm. psychology they just you know have their a priori um tar with a broad brush and um, they're mad that the mainstream so-called doesn't engage them while they bash the mainstream. Here's, a, here's an interesting example. Many years ago at APA, Daryl Bem was invited by the Division of Theoretical... I wrote about this in that chapter, I think, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to um, have his work critiqued by theorists. And he, and you know, by the end, he was disgusted. He was on the stage and I was like, this is, I'm in the audience going, this is really bad. Not him. Well, you're a determinist and you're a positivist and you're, you know, and all these. And he said, guilty as charged. You know, these aren't his exact words. He, Proud of it. Yes, I'm a scientific determinist. Um, yes, there are aspects of positivism. You know, yeah. oh, and that never happened again. And but look at the arrogance in this. Look at it. They're so arrogant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I'm there like they critique the mainstream, but no one's allowed to disagree with them. I'm the gadfly. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, now we talked about the the bad guy, the so-called bad guys mainstream. Now the good the good side is also not represented accurately, as you point out, the humanities. That's also an, another aspect of your work where say engagement with human with the humanities, with the methods of humanities, the style of that we identify as the humanities, the way somebody in the humanities is interested, shows interest, pursues that interest, uh, that in theoretical and philosophical psychology, we should engage with it, with the real thing, uh, as opposed to our flowery images of it. Right. So that was my article, Taking the Humanity Seriously, in the Review of General Psychology. And remember, I started out in the humanities. I, you know, started out painting in oils at age eight. I started majoring in studio art but then quickly got out when i realized like, like kept taking art history like you know 10 courses in art history um the italian renaissance was my favorite although i have many things i love um many many you know like half a dozen or so english lit courses so and i have friends in the humanities because bowden as a liberal arts college i had lunch with people every day in classics and English and romance languages and um, physics and chemistry. So like I'm going back to and like I'm learning all this stuff. And in the process of all this, I got to be friends with two, not at Bowdoin, but two very, very prominent, highly decorated scholars, uh, Mary Lefkowitz, at Wellesley and Leo Steinberg is at the University of Pennsylvania, a Renaissance and modern art critic and historian, Mary, ancient Greek um, history and mythology. And I saw how they were getting bashed, which I wrote about in my um, paper, Taking the Humanity Seriously. And then I realized that the words that were being used to bash them were the same words the, the mainstream was using. I mean, that the theorists were using to bash the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And that's because some of the same ontological and epistemic 
wars that are going on in among the you know between the theorists and the researchers were going on in the classical you know antiquity scholars and the renaissance art scholars and other humanities and so when uh, the uh, theoretical psychologists decide the next answer to our not getting uh, you know attention from the mainstream is to um, you know adopt the, the psychological human so-called psychological humanities and become a humanities scholar um, and blur the boundaries between science and humanities, it's like that's the sal salvation that's their savior and they have no idea or if they do they're not talking about it that the same wars are going on so whose version of mary lefkowitz's work do you use whose version of, i mean these people are getting called the same names <laughs> that mm -hmm. they're so you know know what you know caveat emptor you know know what your I mean, I'm all for using human human humanity scholarship in research if it helps advance your your work, but know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and what you're talking about is not a unitary, completely in uh, something that is in harmony with itself, and it's kind of like this Garden of Eden of the humanities. It it has its own conflicts. And, you know, Thomas started talking about the psychological humanities, and I don't know if it was to him that I said, I said this to someone, it's like, what humanities aren't psychological? Mm -hmm. By definition, it's not theology, it's not theological, it's humanities, humans. How can you have, you know, humanistic um, study without something psychological entering? Right. Right. So I don't even understand the term, and no one has been able to explain it to me, but a lot of them aren't talking to me. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make sense without already identifying the natural scientific psychology. If we accept that, then in contrast to it, it is uh, we identify the complementary or the other alternative. Well, it's fine. I mean, it's again, I don't take issue with... Um, you know, I mean, I have humanistic sensibilities. I don't mean humanistic psychology, but humanities, because there's I'm, I was so, you know, steeped in them that I don't go to a city without hitting the art museums mm -hmm. and, you know, theater and all that stuff. So it's like, you know, you can't just like, okay, I'm taking the humanities and I'm putting it here and mm -hmm. this is better. Right, right. <laughs> Yeah, it is definitely not that simple. Um, now, let's get a little bit into this charge of scientism. Scientism being scientific, there was a volume of uh, of, of essays, um, I think published in 2015. Dan Robinson was involved. Um, oh, right, and, yeah. and, and the recent um, books by... Oh yeah, yeah. The Rutledge. Uh, by yeah, Williams and who was was with the Williams one, the I think Brent's life was also Brent, one of the yeah, all of them. Yeah. Yeah. Slice, um, Jeff Sugarman, Jack mm -hmm. Martin. Um yeah, yeah. The it's scientism, scientism, scientism. Mm -hmm. Um uh Dan Robinson and Richard Williams, yeah. Um, okay, I I, so, have, I, yeah. I read that paper because I did like, what the hell did I say? About it? Something like, oh, yeah. oh, I forgot that I said that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that, that experience. Okay. So what I the way I understood it, your, your paper is that it's not that what they are saying is completely invalid, but it is not helpful to continue with this accusation of scientism because. I think you point out to how much it doesn't accomplish, uh, how much it divides the two sides. Excuse me, go well, ahead. Um, well, on the one hand, they want the researchers to pay attention to them. On the other hand, they want to beat them to death. So I say, which way do you want it? What do you want? Right. And my answer is, if you don't like the way they're doing it, do it a different way and see who comes. Mm -hmm. 
do it, do the science, stop bashing the mainstream, do the science your way and see who pays attention in the marketplace of ideas. I know that sounds capitalist, but that's, you know, that's basically how, how um, scholarship works. Yeah, right. Um, and I don't mean to, who comes? I don't mean by money. I mean, just gives you attention. Um, it's just, again, the tarring with a broad brush. You're all reductionistic. You're all scientistic. You're all incorrigible. If you, first of all, there's, as I say in my paper, there's no one agreed upon definition of scientism. Um, and I also in my paper go into, does it entail pseudoscience? Does it entail bad science? Um, and some of, not all of them, but some in some places I found people who said, yes. Um, and um, yeah, anti, like some are anti-science, pseudoscience and bad science. Um, and some of them have, like they say, we're not, like Jack Martin said, I'm not anti-science, I'm just against pseudo-empiricism. Mm -hmm. um, well, that seems like you're connecting scientism and pseudoscience to me, but, uh, and the quote is in the, um, is in the paper. Or I think John, John, uh, Jim Lamiel somewhere says bad science. It's in the paper. The reference is in the paper. By the way, I, I get criticized for giving quotes with names. And I'm like, this, people put this in print. Yeah, it's in public. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, It's fair game. And um, it, I have to, to show the evidence of what I'm, what my critique is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't want, if you don't, if you feel bad about me quoting you, don't say those things. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, and, yeah. yeah, so um, if you want to take a certain line of research or a particular study and argue uh, by this definition of scientism, it's scientistic and here's how it could be done in a non-scientistic way or why it could be better, why this question shouldn't be asked because it's about a concept like intuition and it's not about personhood in historical and cultural mm -hmm. context. Um, you know I'm speaking code. Um, uh, that's fine. I mean, I'm not gonna argue. I, I think there are, I mean, like astrology is scientific, right? Some mm -hmm. new wave stuff is, scientific, but you in the paper I go into, what are the reasons for calling out a discipline as scientific? Well, one is to protect your discipline from scientific criticism. And um, I wonder if the theorists are calling with a broad brush, the mainstream scientific, not only on their march to destroy mainstream psychology, but um, to inoculate themselves mm -hmm. against the kind of criticism I give. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you, uh, might, yeah, you, you might yeah. be applying the positivistic logic to... Uh, or to not, I work. wouldn't say positivistic logic, Western logic. Well, oh, even worse. <laughs> even worse. Yeah. But uh, to be, I mean... From one one way to to compare this uh, the natural scientific psychology, if you roughly have that divide, if you work with that divide, and the people who are doing philosophical or theoretical work, there is an advantage given to the natural scientists because of the broader context of techno capitalist um, that society that that rewards them differently. So you said that let's do let's do work and see who will attract more. Um, Not who will I attract think... more? No, no, no. Not who will attract more. I mean, it's quasi capitalist because I'm not talking about money and I'm not talking about numbers. The theorists are complaining that no one pays attention from mm -hmm. the mainstream. No one. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's their tar, tar with a broad brush claim. Mm -hmm. Do it differently. Stop bashing them. Use your theory to do some re empirical question differently. And some have. Louis Sass, Fred Wurst, Richard Lafleur have done that. And they've done very good work. And just see 
you know, who finds that injury? Like, like, where does that go? Not how many, but does any, does it get discussed in the literature? Does right. it get picked up? The thing that you're complaining doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. Does okay. it attract any interest? So anyway, right. I wanted to, I'm sorry, I wanted yeah, to. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no. That, that was, was Barbara from the Bronx moment. No, no, no. It was good. It was good. Uh, okay. I just wanted to uh, also highlight that there is a funding advantage for the people who are doing empirical research, uh, which is, you know, it makes sense, but it doesn't re reduce the responsibility of the theoretical side to engage with them, to engage with what they do. The humanities are dying in the, I mean, the irony of let's turn to the humanities is their budgets have been cut. <laughs> in my paper, taking the humanities seriously, I talk about how huma some humanities scholars are upset that the humanities are becoming scientistic mm -hmm. in order to get funding. Mm -hmm. um, you yeah. know, no, I want to respond to this. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. I mean, philosophy lines, English lit lines, art history lines, language lines are getting cut. You trained as a psychologist have the lucky position of being able to teach psychology <laughs> and actually have a job. <laughs> I am not looking on the bright side. I mean, it's, it's still hard if you, you know, in terms of getting funding, and I'm sympathetic to that. I tried to get funding. I was, God, I came up um, first alternate at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton to write back to reality. I sent it a proposal, not, but you know, no one turned them down of the 15 and they hardly ever take psychologists. Um, and that's, it's crummy, you know, that there's that bias, but you have a job and you're having your say, and you're whining that no one is listening. And if you had gotten PhDs in philosophy, you'd be able to go to the Na Na uh, National Humanities Council and other places. Um, but that's how it is. <laughs> and you knew that going in. You knew that you know, that by doing this kind of research, you would not get the kind of grants anywhere near, if at all, the researchers got. You knew that. So stop whining. Right. Stop fetching. You knew that. And if you didn't know that, you should have. Mm. You know I'm talking in code. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if yeah, you but, didn't know that you should have yeah. so so be in a grown-up and take some responsibility and meanwhile you're not being shut up you're not getting funding but you're in you have journals you're whatever you're you know or i couldn't be writing my critiques of you if mm -hmm. that's right that's right well i really wish we had met uh, earlier <laughs> i mean for, because i learned a lot from from your point of view, thank you. So my, I, thank uh, you. Uh, yeah, it it would have been uh, really helpful. I mean, it's not it's not never too late, but uh, it would have been uh, different if I had met you or uh, you know to have this kind of conversation with you maybe ten years ago or seven years ago. Can you say how it would have been different? Uh, so here's very short my the summary of my career. I was in the so-called mainstream. I was a researcher in cognitive psychology of attention and perception. I saw the limitation of that. I got attracted to theoretical and philosophical psychology, Division 24, was hugely disappointed in that, that community, thought, okay, there's no alternative then, I just quit academia. So- You needed Barbara from the I, Bronx. Yeah, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's right. But it's, you know, that what the Barbara from the Bronx attitude can still apply in my situation because I'm officially outside of academia, but I can still do work in my spare time. I can still read. It's not, uh, it's not finished. As you said, the, the situation is difficult. It is dire. 
if you're in the humanities, if you're if humanities. It, it is dire. And, you know, and I include philosophy and philosophy of psychology in that. It is. I don't deny that. But we can still work. Yes. Yes. And maybe if after 50 years of not getting attention, I don't mean you, but the theorists, maybe try a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. And in my view, they're digging themselves in, a, in an entrenched hole, you know, circling the wagons, entrenched hole, and they're whining that no one's paying attention and they're digging deeper. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, we could write something together. I love the thing on... Uh, the self... Uh, application of um, in, in, in Asia that the uh yeah I mean that would be really interesting to write together it'd mm -hmm. be fun yeah yeah uh to conclude our conversation I usually ask for you know general recommendations to students interested in psychology especially interested in developing their own perspective and research interests um I know in our private conversation you said you won't give uh book recommendation but more print you know more foundational uh it's very, attitude it's very simple follow your interests and you can't know that a priori you get into something you start studying and like what interests you i went to this conference on postmodernism and therapy. And I came back hysterical <laughs> and mm -hmm. ran into Ed Poles and he said, calm down, calm down. And, you know, and that that's where it began. Like my emotional react, but like, where do you go? Ding, ding, ding. I want to know more about that. Or that sounds wrong. Or that sounds right. Or why is it right? Or so see the, the best way is to, um, first of all, know, you know, take your courses in everything. It doesn't just have to be psychology. Mm -hmm. See what interests you um, um, and pursue it. And like, then like, I didn't know anything about intuition when Lisa wanted to do a book with me on it, but I, you know, but I was interested in knowing more about it. So I started reading and learning while I worked on the book with her and got chapter authors. So you you know you have to follow your interests and beware of um of professors who are dogmatic about or about one way of thinking mm -hmm. or why this is all bad right. and this is you know splitting defenses and right. in, in the clinical world and um and, you know, talk to other professors about your ideas and talk to, you know, people in different disciplines. You have to, you're kind of feeling your way through blindfolded. Mm -hmm. There's no magic trick. There's no magic book. Yeah, yeah. There might be magic books for you, for an, an individual, but no. Uh, no, no. But I mean, if you get interested in something, then there might be a book that opens your magic. eyes. Right, more right. because you're interested in that mm -hmm. and i'm always happy to talk to young people if they want to contact send me an email okay um you can put that in there and i sure. tried them barbara from the bronx advice like mm -hmm. i did for 35 years with my students thank you very much professor held it's barbara been a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, looking forward to speaking with you more and i hope I will, so i will uh share links to your website and also to some of your op-eds in the show show notes or descriptions of the okay video. <laughs> okay thank you. thank you so much